Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to our August OpenNTF webinar. Today we have Jesse Gallagher talking about XPages Jakarta EE support. Jesse's been involved in this topic for quite a while, and I'm looking forward to this webinar. Uh, so today we have our presentation. We'll go through a couple quick upfront uh, slides, and then at the end we'll have questions and answers. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank our OpenNTF sponsors. Um, in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, thank um, HCL, who has given you know a nice donation to OpenNTF to help run webinars and things like this and contests, and we help support the user group activities uh, that go on, um, as well as Prominic, who kind of behind the scenes donates basically the entire IT structure for OpenNTF, as well as the uh, support needed to keep that running. So thanks to both companies. And I think everyone's aware OpenNTF is all volunteers. It's an open source community. Uh, so if you'd like to help out, let us know. There's a, a lot of little projects going on. There's a couple of projects, um, a presentation project that's ongoing that could probably use some help that's kind of neat. Uh, so just let one of us know on the board and We'll steer you to the right person or project. And we're planning a September webinar, uh, and we'll announce that in the next week or two. Uh, just watch our webinars page for more information. Um, Graham, do you want to say a word about the upcoming elections? Yeah, sure. So we are in uh, uh, nearing the end of our annual uh, period uh, for the board and elections will be happening in September. So if anybody is interested in joining the board, there's uh, always going to be open positions and a little bit of turnover each year. So um, by all means, uh, if you feel like you'd get in, like to get involved, keep your eyes on the website. We'll probably have the post up in the next week or two uh, on the time period, but um, start thinking about that. A uh, couple of other quick notes. Um, we have been transitioning away from Slack as our community chat forum uh, for a while now, uh, and we'll, we are using Discord. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of chat still happening in Slack, but we are actually going to turn Slack to read only uh, at the end of this month. So September 1st, uh, OpenNTF Slack chat will become read-only and everybody's going to be redirected over to Discord. Most of the conversation is happening in this Discord now, so that's just a quick reminder of what we've been planning for a while. Um, and I think it's safe to announce that our uh, September webinar is going to be about Docker. We're still uh, finalizing a couple of details, but uh, we've got our primary and secondary speakers lined up. Um, so join us for uh, an ongoing conversation about Docker in September. Okay, thanks, Graham. Yeah, we'll put that up on the uh, on the website in the next uh, few days, so you can uh, start to register. And uh, oops, kind of advanced the wrong way. Uh, before we get into how to ask questions, uh, also a reminder: Collapse here uh, registration has opened. Uh, so, um, you know, if you're interested in attending that, that's going to be all virtual this year. Uh, so. Um, anyone can attend, regardless of your location. Uh, so uh, check out that out, and that's going to be in October. I think it's October 17th and 18th. I'd have to double check the dates, but please um, check that out and participate. And they're also, I think he's still looking for speakers as well. So Richard Moy is the person behind that. Uh, in terms of asking questions, um, we'll take your questions at the end. We ask that you ask your questions in the questions pane in the GoToWebinar interface. And the first question is probably going to be, is this webinar being recorded? Yes, it is, as all our webinars are. And that will be on the webinars page on OpenNTF as well. Uh, please keep your questions related to Jesse's topic today. Uh, if you have anything unrelated, uh, you can post that. I have to update this on our Discord channel. Um, so not on Slack, but on Discord is ideally. We are still looking at Slack, but that's going to go away soon. All right, Jesse, I think it's, I'm going to turn controls over to you. All right. Let's see if I can share Keynote here. 
Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I'm going to be talking about the XPages Jacardi EE project, which is it's one of my ongoing projects on OpenNTF. Uh, it's kind of gotten most of my open source focus lately um, for both practical reasons where you know I use it a lot for, for client work, but also because a lot of the other ones like the NSF ODP are kind of doing their job and don't need as much attention at the moment. Uh, as, a, as a bit of introduction, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Jesse Gallagher. Uh, I'm a CTO at a consulting company called I Know Some Guys outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania in the US. I'm the IP manager for OpenNTF, so I handle making sure the projects have their ducks in a row IP-wise as much as I can. Um, I blog at frostilic.us. Primarily, it's uh, basically all about uh, programmer stuff, so this kind of thing I talk about there. Uh, and then I tweet at Gidgerby, uh, which is often about programmer stuff, but not exclusively. So the agenda here, uh, I'll give a quick overview on what Jakarta EE and MicroProfile are. So they are kind of related projects, both uh, both involved with this one. Um, there are distinctions, they, they have their, you know, there used to be more distinctions, but they are distinct. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about this project specifically and, and how that then relates to um, what this is. And then I'm going to go through a couple of the uh, components in there. So there's there are quite a few things that this project brings, um, but the idea of this presentation is to talk about the things that will, you know, if you if you add this to your existing project or start a new one, these will be the main things that you'll probably start with. Um, Maybe you'll start with other ones. There are neat, lots of neat things in there, but I want to uh, focus on like the main ones, like the specific problems that Domino developers will fight, will face a lot, and you know the specific tasks we do and, and how those could be improved with this project. And uh, I'll talk a bit about options for user interfaces. Um, so as I'll get to, uh, I'll mention it later too. But like X Pages is still an option, but there are others beyond that. So prerequisites for working with this project and kind of my assumptions for people uh, in the audience, whether or not they're correct, uh, is that when you're working with this, you should have a comfort with or a willingness to learn Java. So um, some of this stuff would work with SSJS. Uh, most of it will not. Um, you know, if you write classes in Java, you could then use those in SSJS. So you could use the two together, um, but nothing in this project changes server JavaScript at all. Um, so you kind of, basically have to uh, be willing to use Java for this. Uh, it helps if you're already familiar with Java 8 constructs, so the stuff that was added back in uh, 901, the late feature packs, uh, things like optional and stream and lambdas, uh, that certainly helps uh, because a lot of these newer specifications use those extensively uh, for the better, I feel. Uh, and the ability to install plugins in Designer and Domino, both just kind of like your knowledge of how to do that, uh, and then depending on your, your environment, uh, your right to do that on your servers. Um, so, you know, just installing those. You do not need beyond that to know anything about OSGI. Uh, you don't need to start a new app from scratch. So this is not uh, down in the depths. You don't need to know anything about Maven. You don't need to know anything about other build tools. You don't need to know about developing plugins, how the specs work, any of that stuff. Um, you don't need to do that. You just can use this stuff. So the idea is that when you are working with this, you are going to use designer, you're going to do things similar to how you're doing them now, but better. So to talk about the two main um, broad specifications that I'm pulling from, so Jakarta EE on one hand and MicroProfile on the other. So Jakarta EE is the current form of Java EE. So that's you know back from the 90s, uh, you had Java Standard Edition and Enterprise Edition. Uh, I hate that they call everything Enterprise because it's meaningless, uh, but that's what it is. So this was originally run by Sun, then Oracle after they acquired Sun, and now it is fully open source at the Eclipse Foundation. So as of a couple of years ago, uh, Oracle, they had gone through a while, you know, as happens with large companies, sometimes they neglected the platform. Uh, and so they ended up donating it to Eclipse and that has given it a new breath of life. And so now it is 100% open source. All of the specifications go through a new process at Eclipse. All of the reference implementations are fully open source with Eclipse compatible licenses and things are looking good. Um, there were a couple releases, uh, eight and nine, that focused on the open sourcing process, going from Java to Jakarta EE and moving from the Java X dot whatever namespace to Jakarta dot whatever namespace. Um, 
this project focuses uh, basically on Jakarta EE9, which is, as of I think today, still the current one, but it's about to be old. Um, Jakarta EE10 is releasing, I believe, later this month. You know, could be any day now, I think. There are parts of it that already have been approved. Uh, that one has new changes to specifications and it moves to Java 11. Uh, we will eventually be able to use that, I assume, um, but we can't right now. But Jakarta EE9 is very good. Um, and that's that's kind of our target here. So if if you end up researching like what are the what is Jakarta E like, what are this what are apps written for it like, look for things that talk about eight and nine, uh, nine specifically. Now micro profile. This was a it started as a multi-company Eclipse project kind of during Java E stagnation. So uh, four or five years ago, um, Java E was you know it would. It was stagnant um, and so it was kind of a push to say like look we need new stuff specifically they want to do uh, microservices so you know deploy tiny little things in docker containers that, that sort of thing which is a fine architecture it's not really the architecture that domino apps take um, you know you can kind of gear yourself towards that but that's not normally how we do things um, but most of the tools are useful generally. So you'll see, I, I talk about one in particular here, the REST client, and that's just a good tool for Java everywhere. That really has nothing to do with um, writing microservices. And there are a few in MicroProfile that are basically specific to microservice architectures, but most of them are actually just good extensions and good tools. And it's kind of become an incubator for Jakarta EE technologies. Not fully, but some of them, like there's a config specification that is gradually moving over to Jakarta EE and likely other things will happen with, uh, along those lines. So how do these uh, standards relate to this project? So usually Jakarta EE and MicroProfile apps are normally deployed in a server like Glassfish or Liberty as WAR or EAR files, so web archives and enterprise archives. Um, those are not needed here. Domino is our server and NSFs are our packages. So this is as opposed to some of my other projects I have talked about in the past, writing war-based files or applications that would be deployed with the Open Liberty runtime for Domino, which is another one of the things I have at OpenNTF. That's not this. This is all in NSF development. So you're writing code similar to those, but it's all in designer in an NSF. Um, and then this project implements a large subset of both of these, but not all of either. Technically, there's a new uh, Jakarta EE core profile that this would comply with, but we have more than that. Um, so some specs like authentication don't really apply to Domino. Domino does its own authentication. And so having this other spec, you know, I have some ideas from how I could do stuff, but it doesn't really apply. There are other specs like enterprise Java beans that are presumably on the way out. Uh, EJB it has, was the mainstay of Java EE for a long time, but it's kind of being replaced by CDI, which we'll talk about today. Some, like WebSocket, uh, are I have technical limitations, like Domino does not support WebSockets, and so I cannot implement the WebSocket Jakarta uh, libraries on it, at least not yet. Uh, and then there are some I just haven't gotten around to yet. Like there are a handful that would be good, uh, a couple more in micro profile to do with some kind of advanced edge cases, things like that, that I would like to do. I just haven't yet. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. And then a little bit more on this project specifically, what its origins are, what its goals are, what it's meant to be. So this began a number of years ago as adding a few utility specifications. I wanted to improve managed beans and I wanted to add better JAXRS support uh, in NSFs. And then um, part of that was just because it was neat and but mostly it was because for client work, I didn't want to be stuck with what Domino gave us by default. And so I started doing this and I said, well, I can actually just turn this into a real thing. And I can say, well, I also want better JSON support and I want JSP and I want Jakarta NoSQL and a number of other things. And so it's grown from, from just like, here's a handful of little tools into basically here's an app framework that you can use. Um, and you know, I use this for client stuff and I'm also using it for open source stuff and little tools I make, I've been using it more. Uh, and then once I found a bunch of uh, things in Jakarta I liked, I also started pulling things in for micro profile. So again, the REST client in particular has been very useful. Um, this primarily focuses on in NSF development in designer. So where designer is your only tool, you're deploying in an NSF, you edit 
just the same way you do with uh, Java code in XPages. It all happens with that same tool chain. It does have support for OSGI based apps. It takes extra knowledge, um, but that's actually the primary way I use it for client work where we have sprawling OSGI platforms where we used to have custom stuff in there. I put that into this project and now we build on top of that. So that's how we do our REST services. That's how we do our managed beads, uh, et cetera. So it does have some support for that. I do want to document that a bit more, um, but it's primarily, the project is primarily geared around ENNSF development with no knowledge of OSGI. So how to use it? Uh, you download it from OpenNTF. There'll be a link to that at the end of this. Also, it's I updated it recently, so it's on the OpenNTF.org code page right now. Uh, then you install the plugins and designer in the server, the same way you would with Poi for X pages, or you used to have to do with the extension library and et cetera. Um, then you enable the libraries and the XSP properties editor. There are a lot. Um, the way I've done it so far is that each feature I add as another library. Uh, that's fine at first. Now it sucks. Uh, I'm probably going to shrink that down quite a bit to say here's the core ones and then here are the add-ons, uh, but that's not the case yet. Um, but then once you're done with that, you get to coding. So there's no um, other server deployment. Uh, some features do require changing Java policy and try to work on that, but there are edge cases. Uh, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do, uh, you don't have to write with other tools. You don't have to do anything with Maven again. You just work right out of design. So as far as examples go, uh, almost all the code in this presentation is from the in-development OpenNTF home database. This isn't publicly available yet because the repo it's in also has a bunch of our other internal stuff that you know probably could be open source, but I don't really want to whitewash it all necessarily. Um, so I will uh, probably take at least snapshots, either move the whole thing to another repo or take snapshots of that and make that publicly available at some point, just because it is turning into probably the best real world example of this um, that is not a corporate owned project. Um, the XPages JE project repo itself contains an example uh, NSF. It started out as kind of more useful than it is now because now it's kind of, it doubles as a the database for the integration test suite. So I have all sorts of services that are um, specifically meant to work with a test to test some feature. Uh, and so it's kind of got a little sprawling and it's not quite as good as a uh, example database anymore. Um, but fortunately, most of the examples, if you search for one of these things, uh, they should work. So if you search for how to do X, Y, or Z in JAX-RS, you will probably find an answer that will work here. If you search for how to do something in CDI, you will probably find an answer that will work here. So obviously, you know, sometimes people will be talking about specific other servers or specific other technologies, but just in general, if somebody's talking about the spec as such, if you find like a, a bail dung tutorial, which I will link to quite a bit in this, um, that should work. Like that will largely be the same. You could ignore the stuff about building it with Eclipse or Maven or whatever, but just working with the specs should be the same here, which is a nice benefit. Like they're just uh, using these technologies dramatically broadens the pool of knowledge that we have uh, to, to drink from. So I'm gonna start now talking about this, some, some of the specific things and the ways that they show up in average applications. And I'm gonna start uh, with kind of like a, a smaller one, it's powerful and it's also familiar. So it's expression language. So this is our old friend. Uh, the current spec Jakarta expression language grew out of what started in JSF, which was also the one from XPages. So JSF was the first one that had this form of expression language. This is the foo.bar in curly brackets. Um, and it started there, XPages took that as it was. It did grow a little bit in JSF beyond what we got in XPages. Um, and then it kind of then was brought out. It was called unified or universal, I think unified expression language for a while. And now it's just Jakarta expression language. Um, if you turn this on, existing EL expressions that you have will still work, including SSJS. Uh, so it doesn't change that. Um, it doesn't change the XPath expressions if anybody ever used those other than me. Um, those will still work and the syntax is the same. It is a superset of the old uh, EL. So it is a little stricter about nulls, but I found that to be actually useful. So if you have an existing application and you turn this on, um, you might get exceptions in places that you didn't previously, but most likely those places were typos and, and 
subtle bugs that you would not have found otherwise because the other the X pages interpreter is more lenient and just said ah it's empty, uh, but now it's a little stricter about when your base object is null. And whenever I've done that, I've I found tons of places where I see oh I was referring to it by the old variable name or I had a typo in the variable name or something along those lines, uh, and it's been definitely actually helpful to have it yell at me more. Uh, for this one, there's no configuration necessary. You just enable the library and it will take over. You can configure it. You can change it depending on your needs. Um, there are a few things you can do, but for the most part, it's just check the box and then you have better expression language in your existing XPages applications. So what do you get? You get the same stuff as before, for one. So, you know, the, the pound sign foo dot bar and foo uh, square bracket bar, et cetera, um, for value references and method references. All that stuff is the same. It's exactly the same syntax. It's just slightly newer as a framework. But beyond that, you get function calls. Uh, I would say this is probably the most common um, unanswerable question or disappointing question on Stack Overflow with EL for X pages is, hey, I took this thing from online that shows calling a function in expression language and X pages yells at me. Uh, with this, it will not yell at you. A designer might, but the runtime will not. So functions are legal uh, when you're calling uh, expression language like this. So uh, that's probably one of the biggest bugaboos that we've had for expression language for a long time. And that's because slightly newer versions of EL than what XPages has supported. And this one does now too. You also get, this is one that I've hit a couple of times, uh, string concatenation. Plus equals is a weird operator for this, but I guess they were low on operators. Um, now you can do a string concatenation inside an expression, which I don't think you can do with uh, X pages. You have to combine expressions, which is sometimes not quite what you want it to do. So that's a nice nicety. There's also some other weird stuff like um, Lambda expressions. I haven't tried. You might be able to use those as method references. I'm not sure. Um, they might work, uh, but there's just kind of like a couple other niceties. Um, but it's essentially, what you have now, but significantly newer. I think you know you could call the one that's in XPages version one. This is, I believe, version four at this point, three or four. Um, one of those major updates was just for the namespace change. So some examples. Uh, I'm going to have examples for each of these. This is by far the lightest uh, because EL is EL. So you can do the same thing that you did before. You can now call functions within expression language. I do mention that there's the EL pre colon prefix on this. If you leave that out and call a function, designer will say it's illegal uh, because it doesn't know anything about newer X pages or newer EL. Uh, but if you do the EL colon prefix, it'll instead say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Here's a warning. I'll just let you do it. Assume you know what you mean. Um, so that way you can get the X page to save. Um, and then similarly, I did, this is actually one from uh, an example app I have where it's just saying I want to have a data table and the value is calling a function that gives me back a list. So this is um, kind of the normal stuff you would do. Getting to, to function calls will save you a little bit of hassle back and forth with maybe a controller class or something like that. Um, naturally, you could also do the same exact thing, this actually exact syntax in, um, SSJS would also work. So, you know, at that point, a little bit of 601, um, but either way, you could do that now. So, I have some resources here. Uh, I'm linking to the uh, current, the specification that's implemented here. So, if you go to jakarta.ee, you can find all of the specifications. They're actually often surprisingly readable. Like, I've been looking at these documents a lot. And they're not as arcane as you might think. Um, you know, some of them do have more assumptions than others. But generally, if you just read the spec, you'll get quite a bit out of it. Um, so you can, there's a link to that there. And then uh, baildung.com, if you're not familiar with that site, that's basically if you do a search for how do I do X in Java, and baildung is one of the results, go there. Uh, Vogela is also similar in the sense where the tutorials are always extremely good. If it if they're talking about what you want to do, read that instead of anything else. So that's I have uh, one there, and I have that for another uh, number of the other specs. So that's expression language. That's kind of the the smallest footprint as far as the day to day specifications. It's really just a add this in, and now your app is a little better. Uh, so that's kind of a, a freebie if you're using this. Next up, 
I want to talk about managed beans. So, you know, obviously XPages has managed beans. You specify them in faces config.xml. Uh, you specify their scope and the, their class. And then if you get really fancy with it, you can specify managed properties, like saying set the value of this string, this string property to this expression or, or what have you. That's pretty rarely used, but you absolutely can do that and that works. Um, so this is a newer form of that kind of thing. And actually in JS that currently they're deprecating their managed being support in favor of CDI. So the spec is components and dependency injection. Uh, you don't have to care why it's called that and not call it managed means. Uh, you also don't have to care about EJB. So if you don't know about EJB, uh, don't bother asking. It's almost definitely on the way out. It still has its proponents. It still has some things, but um, don't worry about it. Uh, so this CDI uses annotations instead of XML configuration. Um, there is potentially some XML if you needed to, but I have not had to, um, you know, there's, there's, I have yet to have to use these specifics in the beans.xml file, so don't worry about it. Uh, this cooperates with EL and general XPages variable resolution. So when you specify a managed bean with this, you can then reference it with XPages, the normal way you would reference any managed bean. Uh, and so you can and should replace beans and faces config XML entirely. So when I'm writing an app using this, uh, I have just gotten rid of all managed beans references in faces config. Uh, it's pretty much empty unless I'm doing some stuff with um, components component definitions at this point. Um, so I'm, I just don't use managed beans in faces config anymore. So here's an example of one. And so this is, you know, the, the specifics of what the bean is doing doesn't matter, but this is a bean that takes a markdown string and gives you HTML. So it's using a, um, a markdown library, uh, common mark, I think. Um, but you can see here the important parts for the managed bean are that you do at application scoped and then you say at named markdown. So what this does is basically the same as if you had a basis config that said bean class is you know bean dot markdown bean, scope is application and name is markdown. Um, but this is just done with annotations here instead. So as soon as you do this in X pages, you can reference markdown dot to HTML um, and then pass the, the text as long as you're using the newer EL or SSJS. Uh, so this is just the basic, I want to have an application scope bean, I want to name it markdown, done. So this, you know, strictly speaking, doesn't have much advantage itself over um, the basis config way, except in so far that now you see right on your class that it is a bean, that it is called this thing. So it consolidates down um, your, your explanation of what's going on. So there's a little less indirection here, the indirection isn't necessarily harmful, but it's always in these cases nicer to have everything clear. So when you see the class, you're like, ah, this is a bean, I can call it this in code. So you're aware of that. But things do get a little more advanced. Things can actually get way more advanced, but we're only going to get it a little more advanced here. Next up, you want to say you have one bean and you want to include another bean in it. So you say here, I have an encoder bean that has a couple abilities, just general text encoding itself it is a request request scope be named encoder but i want to include the current session the you know lotus domino note session uh, lotus domino dot session um but here i can say uh, as a property on here i can do at inject and then at named domino session giving me this session it's called domino session so it doesn't interfere with um the http session which in other in some other cases uses that so that's one thing to know, but you just call it domino session, you get, this is the equivalent of session in X pages or X live until dot get current session. Um, so this will just give you that object as it goes. So this is a way where you don't have to call X live util or resolve variable. You, know, you still could, it's the same object, um, but here you reference one bean from another. So I have handlers for a couple of the standard X pages things and your other beans will cooperate in this. So if I wanted to inject the markdown bean here, I could, I would just say add inject the markdown bean. Um, so you can reference these things by name. If they are not ambiguous, you can reference them by just their class. Here session is ambiguous because you could also say domino session as signer or domino session as signer with full access. So that's why you have to give this a name. Uh, so, you know, there are a couple uh, intricacies there, but here you kind of get the idea. You're saying this is equivalent to 
variable resolver say give me domino session but here it's saying inject it in here and then cdi will take care of all that handling uh, you could do a little bit fancier stuff with that so here are a couple additional things so here i have a request scoped bean that injects an application scoped bean and it will just handle this you can actually do the reverse too it gets which is interesting because like in in these cases you could say give me the current requests one even though it's being there's a lot of like under the cover stuff that makes all these things work um but you can inject your beans into each other so here there's only one class application guy and there are no additional named ones so that's why i can leave off the named um but i could just say inject to this application scoped bean into my request scoped bean uh, and then it will just handle all that for me so it will know about which when is a different request which is the application scope uh, and then those scopes are also the same as what you uh, have been dealing with with xpages all along this also shows a couple uh, annotated methods here for post construct and post and pre destroy uh, post construct is largely similar to a constructor um, but it's a little more CDI friendly, uh, just because of the way that objects are created and destroyed. Um, generally, it's a little nicer to do this. It gives you, there's like a little more, it avoids some edge case bugs. Pre-destroy is interesting um, because it's kind of like a deconstructor in C++ uh, as long as your scope properly supports it. So here, request scope, it does fully support that. So if, for example, you said in your uh, post construct, you could open up a network resource. Like, you know, if you were making a database connection elsewhere or some other thing, then pre destroy, you could say, okay, well, now destroy that. So, if you had some kind of resource that you needed to close at the end, you can use pre destroy and it will be called at the end of the request. Um, th those things are a little sketchier when you have, for example, session or application scoped beans. I believe those will still work, but they have such long lifetimes that probably don't want to push it by doing that. So I would say in these cases, focus pre-destroy on request because that's kind of an easy one. Um, but you have these other things. There are also more um, events within CDI. There's actually kind of like an internal message passing thing where you have observers and things like that. Um, but I uh, that is less commonly used and, and kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. So, CDI beyond beans. So I mentioned that there are those observers and things. So managed beans are kind of the basic case for CDI and it's most of what we'll use. So usually when you're using CDI, it's really an advantage over um, faces config in that you have annotations and you can use injection. Um, CDI goes way beyond that. Um, it's also kind of turning into the core foundational layer for Jakarta generally. Uh, so it, it undergirds our JAXRS implementation. It undergirds MVC, which we'll get to in a bit. It undergirds Jakarta NoSQL, which we'll also get to. And then pretty much everything in MicroProfile is based on CDI. So it started out as just kind of a nice, simpler, enterprise Java beans that uses nicer semantics and has turned into effectively the, the foundation layer of Jakarta EE. Uh, when you get further into it, things get weird. Uh, there's a lot of proxies and reflection and scanning and all sorts of things. Um, but in general, if you're just writing an app, you don't need that. Um, even when I'm writing an app, I don't need that. I only need that when I'm writing basically the infrastructural stuff to make all this stuff work. And so for a couple of resources, um, I'm linking to the specification. This one may get a little out into the weeds. Uh, so I would say start with this bail done uh, article. It's a little older, but it's still accurate as far as how CDI works. And then there's also a guide on openliberty.io. So Open Liberty, in addition to the app server, does a, num a tremendous number of, or a number of tremendous guides, not necessarily a tremendous number yet, um, but a number of guides for uh, various Jakarta and Spring and microprofile technologies. Uh, and so they have one on dealing with CDI. And so I would recommend going through that. You could either follow along exactly, or you could most likely do that and take the code that applies to an NSF and do that in an NSF. Either way, it's, it's good reading for this. So that covers managed beans. Uh, and then I'm, for the next one, I want to talk about JAXRS. So this is REST services. So this is where you are writing REST services to be consumed by client code. Uh, JAXRS is kind of the, the old name at this point. It's officially Jakarta RESTful Web Services, 
or Jakarta REST. Uh, it's a long-standing framework for REST services. So it's been around for a good long time. Uh, it primarily works with JSON, uh, consuming and producing it, but it can work with anything. You can work with XML, you can work with streaming binary data, you can work with whatever format you want to make up. Um, it will work with that, but it primarily focuses on JSON. There's nothing strictly about the framework that requires JSON, but it's the natural fit, primarily because REST services are also primarily JSON currently. Uh, John Domino does ship with an ancient implementation of JAXRS, so that's Wink, that powers DAS and the extension library. Uh, a number of us have used that in the past. It's like JAXRS 1.2 or something like that. Um, it's quite old. It does okay as far as it goes, but it's missing a number of directly useful things and it doesn't support these new things. Um, fortunately, for our purposes, um, you could just not worry about the old one unless you are already using it and need to migrate or something like that. JAXRS, and always has, including with Link, focuses on using annotations and implicit conversion to keep code clean and meaningful. So if you've written REST services before, you may have had to like manually translate JSON or write it with a JSON writer or generally just read parameters and things like that. And JAXRS is meant to be um, is meant to handle a lot of that stuff for you. Like it can't do 100% all the time, um, but it handles a lot. And it takes a lot of things off your plate that you have to deal with with other, uh, with the, there are other frameworks that work well like this, but with other stuff in Domino, this is much, much more convenient. So here's a basic example. Um, so here I have a resource called application config resource. I say it listens at slash config. It injects a application config bean that I have, so that's just an application scoped bean. Um, and then all I do in my get method is I say I want to produce JSON, and here's the object. I don't have to do anything that says here's how to convert this object to JSON. I don't have to set the content type. I don't have to set anything. I just say on get the HTTP verb produce JSON from this, and then it just does it for me. So you get what you see on the right. So here. The URL ends up being whatever.nsf slash xsp slash app. That's the basis of your JAXRS code slash config. And then it will just give you this JSON. Like I've done no other configuration in this other than creating the application config bean, but there's nothing you know, like the two string does not produce JSON. There's no, you can do JSON annotations to hint to things, but there's nothing on there for that. I just said, take this bean, give me JSON out of it. And it did. Uh, and so that's all you need to worry about. So that's the basic case where you just say, I want to have a REST resource and do JSON and convert from this, and it will do its best to do so. Uh, you can also return a string that will be your own actual JSON. So if you have your own JSON library or your own JSON conversion, you can do that. Um, as I mentioned, you can also produce XML. There are a couple built-in converters for that um, and a number of other things. Uh, but again, JSON is the most common and ideally you wouldn't have to worry about your own JSON conversion unless you really want to for some reason. It can also handle consuming content. So I mean, in the previous one that was just get, uh, here is you're taking a post. So here is a kind of semi-contrived example of taking a uh, common HTML uh, form format, so URL encoded forms, where it's just first name equals whatever and last name equals whatever, uh, and producing JSON. Uh, but you do a couple extra things here. So for one, I'm still just saying post, and then it consumes and produces. So these are things that, you know, obviously this isn't English syntax, but you can kind of read it as in that kind of way, where you're saying at this path, if you post form URL encoded, you will get back JSON. And then the method itself, the parameters are annotated. So I'm saying, give me the form parameter of first name, make sure it's not empty. So this is actually bean validation, which I'm not covering specifically, but is implicit in a lot of these things of the first name. And then form param of last name, which is not validated uh, and call that last name. So this is just a Java method and you're doing these annotations on here to tell them what it should map to. Uh, and then I just say create a new person, set its first name and last name, and then return the results of saving it into a repository. So this, you know, the specifics of what that repository is are not germane at the moment, um, but just imagine that that's something that will save a object to a database and then return a version of that object with like ID and stuff filled in. Uh, 
and then that returns it. So what will happen is it will read in this URL encoded form, browser compatible or just from the command line, uh, and then return a JSON version of this person. So you'll get a JSON object that says first name is you know foo and last name is bar, whatever you do. Um, and so this will handle that that creation. Um, the fact that post creates an object is common but not required, and you know you can do whatever. But this is a very common idiom for doing a REST service. And then in that one, I was talking about uh, posting URL encoded stuff. And here I want to talk about posting JSON. So here it's a similar thing where I want to do a put. So another HTTP verb that in this case will mean put a new version of the same person on top of it to update the, the code. And so what I'm doing is saying I want to do a path parameter. So as opposed to where, before where I had create as a hard coded path, here I'm just saying, well, if it's not a hard coded Term that I've had in there, treat it as an ID, and then I will use that to get the U and ID. So it will be, you know, people slash some ID. And, and now I'm saying it consumes JSON and produces JSON. So this is meant for JavaScript or another um, client library, you know, a native app or something like that to deal with. Uh, and I can read in the path parameter, and then I can do at valid, which is being validation again, saying whatever you're putting in, follow all the rules of person. So if the person object says, that the first name has to be uh, not empty and the last name has to be at least three characters. First off, don't do that. Some people's last names are not three characters. That's a common problem, don't do it. But if you did, uh, it would do that check. Um, and then it will make sure that is valid. And if it isn't, it will just not call the code. It will give you an error instead. Uh, it give the client an error. Um, but here it sets the UNID to be true and then saves it and then returns JSON. So this is basically how you would write part of a uh, REST CRUD API. And so you would just have methods like this. You'd be writing Java methods and you would annotate them up to say what they produce, like where they listen, what the method is, what they produce, and what they consume. And then you just write this. And then as you're looking back at your class, it's all, you know, more or less, you know, I hate saying self documenting because it's rarely truly self documenting, but this does get close to self documenting. And so JaxRS is a big spec, uh, those kind of cases are actually by far the most common things that you're going to do. Um, but there's a lot to learn potentially. So uh, here I have, again, the specification. This bail dung article says uh, Eclipse MicroProfile, but it's actually primarily about JaxRS. JaxRS is one of the primary specs shared in MicroProfile from Jakarta EE. So if you read that article, it's actually primarily just about writing REST services of various kinds. And it's talking about here's how you would do a microservice, which um, is you know, certainly uh, uh, something you can do in Domino, but it applies generally. And then again, here's an open liberty uh, guide for dealing with JaxRS. Uh, incidentally, these open liberty guides tend to have steps where you'll write maven pom.xml files and do all that. Again, you can do that if you want to, but the code part, like the Java parts, generally apply to the NSF without having to worry about the, the compilation and running in open liberty steps. So that covers uh, producing REST services. And I want to talk about consuming REST services. So, you know, it's one thing when you have your, your app that's, that has these endpoints that other things can call, but eventually you're going to want to call other services. So you want to get a list of releases for a project on GitHub, or you want to call a, you know, a e-commerce endpoint or something. Um, you're going to want a REST client and that helps a lot. So this is a way to, take a lot of the dirty work of writing a REST client before uh, or out of it. So for example, in LotusScript, you have the uh, HTTP client classes there. In Java, traditionally, you have URL connection, which is very low level. Uh, and then even in JaxRS, you have client classes. But what MicroProfile REST client does is sits a layer above that, where you write an interface that matches what you would be writing if you wrote that as a server. Uh, and then you use that as a client. So it pairs with JSONB, which is the JSON binding library in Jakarta, uh, to translate between remote JSON and local Java classes. Um, and one nice nicety about this is that there are tools like OpenAPI Generator that can generate bindings for this. So if you are given an OpenAPI spec, uh, either out of an app using this toolkit, which does that, or uh, other uh, toolkits like, for example, Keep publishes and actually um, starts from OpenAPI. Um, you can generate bindings for that and you'll have that and you'll just get code out of that. And it's very, very convenient. Uh, you know, sometimes it will just be an already existing library for a, for a client. Um, 
a client library for Java, but being able to generate fresh if that doesn't exist, or if you don't want to use like Jackson or whatever, um, you can use this instead. So here is a um, bunch of code, but here is, I was talking about calling GitHub, but here's a way that you would call the GitHub issues API from Java and then list it on X pages. So this is actually where one of the EL examples came from before. So here on the, the kind of top left section, not, not quadrant section here, I guess, um, you could say, I want to register a REST client. The baseline is api.github.com. Uh, this could be your server or whatever. Uh, and then I want to do, you basically write what looks like a JAXRS class. So you'd say the path is this, where you'd say it's repos, and this is just matching. If you look at the GitHub API documentation, this is just an adaptation of that. I did this one manually. I'm sure you can, um, I'm sure you could find a GitHub library for this, but you, know, you can do it manually in a quick case. And I'm going to say there's a method where if I call get on that URL, it will, whatever it's doing will produce JSON, and I can give it path parameters of owner and repo. And then uh, I will get a list of issue objects. So here I'm creating a class called issue. Um, and then I give it the parameters I care about from that. There's actually quite a bit more in the actual library or in the actual API from GitHub, but I only care about these. You can see here I'm doing JSON B property to translate from created underscore at, which is a very JSON y way to name something, to just created, which is a more Java like way to name it, or you know, I could create it at in camel case. Um, and then I'll have getters and setters in there. And then in a bean, I just say, and this is using CDI, I just say inject the GitHub issues client. You'll notice I never write an actual implementation for it. I just it say inject the client and then microprofile will do magic and it will give me one uh, and it will figure that out. And then if I want to actually get the list of issues for a given organization and repository, I just call client.get because that's the method I had. And then under the covers, it is using CDI magic to translate that into a HTTP get call for api.github.com slash repos, blah, blah, blah. And then taking the JSON that comes back and translating that into a JSON array, and then taking those issue objects and turning it into a list. And like, you don't have to care about any of that. Like this just happens for you. Like this is all of the code, I mean, minus the SNPs. Uh, this is all of the code in the application. There is nowhere where I'm actually doing an HTTP call. There's nowhere where I'm translating from a JSON response into a list of issues. Like that is happening in the framework below the level of my application. Uh, so that is, it saves you so much work. Like this, this will save so much hassle when you're doing this kind of thing. Anytime you're dealing with remote, uh, service. This is why, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in MicroProfile, like this is the biggest one as far as normal cases go, because at some point we all have to deal with some kind of REST API. And this is so much simpler and so much nicer to deal with um, that it is, it is remarkable. And so here, because I got back a list of GitHub issue objects, I can then in a data table, just say, give me a, you know, bind to that value and it will iterate over the list and this is all you know so here i have an x page that's reading from a remote service technically kind of similar to some of the stuff back from the social business toolkit and all that but this is nice clean code it's a little more explicable um obviously things can get weirder if you have like OAuth tokens between them or jwt authentication or you need other headers that are added in these are all possible these are covered by uh by this client it just gets a little more complicated than even this slide could handle. But in the normal case, which is actually a very common case, this kind of thing will cover you. So for more release, for more resources on this, um, the specifications for MicroProfile are stored at GitHub under tags. So if you go there, you can read the specification for the REST client. That is also kind of well, not not kind of, it is documentation because it's a specification. Um, but then again, here, uh, the Open Liberty site has a guide for dealing with the REST client and covering um, to this kind of case and things that I believe are a bit more complicated than this. Now I want to talk a bit about data access. So up until now, this has all just been in the abstract. Uh, I haven't really talked that much about how you actually get data and store it in Domino or elsewhere, but probably in Domino. Um, in these cases, you can do the same way that you've been doing data access all along. So you can do xlibutil.getCurrentDatabase and then 
say document doc equals database dot create document. You can read views, you can do all that. Like it'll still work. This is all still an NNSF. This is all still in an X pages environment. This is all still the same stuff. So you can do that. And and for a good while, that's what I was doing. I was using I was using ODA um, and just accessing those objects. And you know, a lot of code still does. Uh, but I don't like it. I, I want to get out of the business of writing code that targets a specific database API in general and lotus.domino in particular. Um, I just don't want to do it. Like every once in a while it'll be necessary, but I want things to be cleaner. Like I want to write less stuff because anytime I have to do view iteration explicitly in code, that means that that code can't can't as easily be optimized by the underlying stuff. Like view iteration, you can do efficiently, but anytime you're actually just doing, get this document or get this entry or skip five or whatever, like the API can help, but you can't, you wanna do things more declaratively. You just wanna say, because you don't care about documents. You don't care about view entries. You care about the data. You care about, I wanna get this object. I wanna show this thing to the user. The fact that it's a document, the fact that you do get entry by key is not important for this. Those things are not important. Um, so Jakarta NoSQL is a specification that it's technically still in beta um, and it's not yet officially included in JEE releases. It will likely be included in Jakarta EE 11. Um, it's still in process, um, but it's pretty far along now. It's uh, the one that we target here is beta four. It's solid, you know, I've been using it regularly. Um, it's meant to be similar to JPA. So if you've done Java EE stuff in the past, uh, with Hibernate or other libraries. Um, JPA is a toolkit that focuses on uh, relational database access, so not Domino. Um, Hibernate has a OGM project that was meant to be like JPA for NoSQL. It kind of, I don't think it went that far. Uh, I mean, it was good for what it did, but I think it kind of petered out. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but Jakarta NoSQL is meant to be like, okay, well, JPA is not really a good fit for NoSQL databases of any kind. And so what this is, is it says, this is going to be a standard specifically for NoSQL databases, meaning um, key value, column, document, so Domino and graph. Um, and thanks to DQL, Domino is now a practical data source for it. So when I first got into Jakarta NoSQL, um, I wrote a driver for Darwino, which had uh, arbitrary queries that were very fast. Domino did not. So with Domino, you know, Jakarta NoSQL is based around arbitrary querying of, of the pool of documents, kind of like, you know, primarily like Mongo and Couch and things like that too. Um, and Domino was just awful for that. Like you could do a formula search and it would be terrible performance. You could do a full text search and it would be extraordinarily inconsistent. Um, but otherwise you would basically have to read views. Um, now we have DQL and while, you know, sometimes you might need to tweak it, the point of DQL is to make it so that you can do these arbitrary queries and it so does the work for you, which is what I was kind of hinting at before, which is you want the database to do the work for you to make it fast. So with DQL, you say, here's my query, do whatever you need to do to get me these documents. And it does. And so if it can read from a view, it will. If it can read from full text index and it fits with your query, it'll do that. Like it can make things fast. Uh, and so now it is practical to do that. And so now I was able to write this driver and make it actually usable. So Jakarta NoSQL provides a standard behavior for databases, but it does encourage per database customization. So even in the SQL world, databases have all had their own little um, special behaviors and what they're good at and enhancements, but that is especially the case for Jakarta NoSQL. So, and even more so for, uh, for Domino. So Domino is a weird beast. You know, with DQL, we can do just arbitrary document queries, but there's all sorts of stuff with dealing with rich text and dealing with attachments, dealing with views where you want to read things even more efficiently than DQL currently can. Sometimes views are the way to do it. Like you have essentially pre-calculated reports. You want to read those. Those may or may not exist in other systems, so they don't really have their own thing. So fortunately, JNOSQL is meant to be extended in this way. Uh, and there's quite a bit of stuff that I've done. I've expanded, I added some more stuff today. Well, actually, I fixed some stuff today. Um, but there's a lot of specific behavior that will let you do the things that you want to do with Domino. So get document by key, all that stuff. But you do that in a declarative way, let the driver take care of it. You just write code saying, give me this object that happens to be by key. So here, 
Uh, you can see the specification, it's still in progress, but it's at the Jakarta EE site. The specification hasn't changed too much lately. I think it's pretty staid at this point. It's probably gonna look a lot like this by the time it actually hits 1.0. Um, and then once again, there is a bail done site here for um, for getting some, I get a good tutorial on, on how to work with it generally. So the way that you work with this is very similar to JPA. It kind of just takes the same annotation name. So you say, here is my class and I want to call it an entity. So entity from JPA just means this is an object that will match to or map to the database. So here I call it project. Um, skip over this repository provider bit and repository for a second. We'll come back to that. Uh, so in the class itself, you do specify your columns. So you say, here's my ID, which maps to the UN ID. So that will just be a string. Then you say column of project name here that will map to name, column of project overview. So these project name and project overview are the item names from the documents. So you say, you know, here's what I expect to map here. And then here's the data type I expect. Um, it is domino, so you can always just put object there and then deal with it in your code if you don't know what is actually in the field currently. If you put one of these supported types, it will try to coax it into it. And then with domino again, almost all the time, that'll work. Um, but you do always have that, that, that safety valve of saying, ah, it's object. Um, but here, th but this is doing that translation that we've probably all written many, many, many times. So, you know, people have, they, they'll, they'll gussy it up into, they'll call it DAO for data access objects, uh, et cetera, or they'll, they'll have their own layers and all that stuff. This is meant to be that layer. You write your entity, the JNOSQL drivers will take care of all that mapping for you. Going back up now to the repository class. So the main way that you interact with these are actually a couple ways in JNOSQL, I only really care about repositories, is by creating these repository interfaces. So here I wanna say, I'm gonna create a repository for project that extends from Domino repository, which means I get a couple, I get some bits of extended Domino behavior. Um, and then you can declare methods, and this is weird when you're not familiar with it, but then it starts feeling better. Uh, it will be, it will synthesize implementations based on the name of the method. So here I'm saying, I wanna get an optional project, which means it may or may not exist. You will always get a non-null value back, but the optional may or may not be present. Um, then you say find by project name. And so the driver will see that and see, and it says, ah, find by, that means I'm going to do a query. And then it says project name, which means that it will take the project name parameter and say that must mean whatever project name maps to, then do that equals that as the query. So this ends up getting translated down into a DQL query that says project name equals, and then the escaped value of whatever you pass in with project name. Um, there are other variations. There's some neat stuff you can do. You can pass in pagination and sorting, and it will take care of that with query results processor for you. Um, and then there are some extended things that I'll get to in a bit for reviews. Um, but the idea here is that you can just kind of like write what you intend and a lot of time it will work. Uh, so if you have a property on your object, you can just write that out and it will do the work for you. Now, when you want to actually use this, and so this is code from the OpenNTF site, uh, I can say inject project.repository, so that's the name of the class. Uh, and then it's using CDI again. So once again, CDI is very foundational here. Uh, it will just inject your repository. Um, you'll note much like with the REST client, you don't write the code for the repository write the interface saying, this is what I want. And then the framework will do the code for you. You don't have to worry about the implementation of how you get a document by project name or how you get view entries. You just write what you want and it will handle it for you. So here I can say, I want to call that find by project name with the key. And then if it's not there, so or else throw is a method on optional. Um, and I say, if it wasn't found, then throw this not found exception. This plays well with JAXRS, which will see a not found exception and turn that into a 404 page. So this is, these are kind of all the specs working together. Uh, and then if it is found, return the project. And then in this case, it will, actually that should be application JSON. I think I had a typo when I was reworking the code here, uh, but it will turn that into JSON. Um, and so you will get a nice, you know, so this is a way to write a uh, REST API for reading projects from your repository. So this is kind of pulling it all together. What will happen in the back end is that you'll have a document in your database called, uh, or with a form equal to project and a field project name equals whatever the project name is. And it will do that query. It will pull that document in. It will load the fields into your object and give you that object back. And it all happens transparently 
behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about doing any of that. You know, in in uh, relational databases, that's ORM, Object Relational Mapper. Um, same idea. It's an object mapper for your your backend database, so it does the work converting all those. You don't have to call get item value string. You don't have to say you don't have to deal with date time. It handles all that. It handles the recycling for you. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, by default, with repositories, um, JNoSQL has a couple methods for CRUD operations. You can find by ID. You can delete by ID. You can save. Um, you can check if something exists by ID, and you can get like a count of, of documents. You can extend that though if you want to do these lookups by writing those methods like that. Um, Domino repository also adds a few more, so you can. Uh, there are a couple methods built in for saying add this document to a folder, remove it from a folder. Uh, when you're saving, you can say compute with form or not. Uh, by default, it won't, but then you can just call the override that does compute with form. Um, and then there are also a number of extensions with annotations for reading from views. Uh, so uh, that can get a bit in the weeds. I don't want to go too far with that right now, in part because I didn't write that slide. Um, but you can really get into it. Um, once I have that, I, I think I've talked about that a bit on my blog. I've extended it some more recently, so that'll be up for another blog post before too long. Um, so you can do a lot of that. And it's meant to be and, and as I'm going, as I'm writing this driver, I'm taking things that I'm doing for client work and saying, okay, I really want to do this with JNoSQL. Can I do it now? Yes, great. Can If I can't, how can I make that happen? Not everything probably is going to fit into that. You can really get into the weeds, but I've added things like you can do mind bean storage like Oda does. Uh, you can do all these view things. You can do get a specific category or find an entry by key or find entries by key you can page through it you can do like the very very common stuff and i want to find all the places that i can't and then except in the really really weird edge cases i want to be able to replace it with this code so this is still working with domino obviously you're writing towards domino because you're using these extended attributes so you wouldn't be able to take this stuff and just swap it out from mongo directly um but you're still writing to this common API and not only like your code is just cleaner, like you're getting more, you can benefit from efficiencies that are added into the driver itself. So right now uh, it's written with uh, Lotus.Domino APIs. It's actually pretty speedy. Like I was doing some tests earlier and I was getting like full page response times of like 32 milliseconds, which seemed pretty good. Um, that was just reading pages of data from views uh, and rendering with HTML and a bunch of other stuff looked up from beans. Um, so you're getting pretty good speeds there, um, but in theory, if it had a lower level API like JNX or something like that, that could speed some things up there. Um, but if that ever happens, you as a user don't have to care. Like there might be one thing you'd have to change, but otherwise you're still writing and all you're doing is saying, I just want to get this from the database. I know Domino semantics and I want to just write an annotation saying, do this semantic for me. I don't care about the specifics. I don't care what class is being used. I don't care about how it's handling the view navigator cache. I don't care how it's iterating over things. I don't care how it's handling recycling. It's just doing that for me. Uh, and you can save so much stuff in here. So as I'm going for the OpenNTF website, um, I'm trying to do this 100% data access with Jakarta SQL. So far, so good. Um, and then I'm going to see how far I can take that. I want to make it so that you can use this for small to medium and probably even large apps. So it's been working out great so far. This is in progress. I've been putting a lot of effort into this, in part because this is a driver that could extend beyond uh, the X pages Jakarta uh, support. Like if you wrote a web app running on Domino, um, not with this toolkit, you could still use the JNO SQL driver. So this will probably have a life beyond this project as well. Uh, and finally, the last big topic I want to talk about is uh, how you write your user interface. So Historically, with XPages, this isn't even a question. Your user interface is XPages because that's the point. You're starting your application from the perspective of I am writing an XPages application. If you're starting with uh, or moving towards Jakarta EE support, you're less thinking about starting with the user interface. You're starting with the structure of your code. You're starting with your beans, with your data access, and then your service, your REST services, and then your user interface. So the user interface question actually remains open up until the time you get to it. Like you can write a lot of business logic without even caring, is it going to be XPages or not? So there, you have a couple options here. The first one is XPages. So it works as well as ever uh, in an NSF when you use these libraries. So you can still access all your XSP pages. You can still write 
server JavaScript code, you can use server JavaScript libraries, you can use all your existing stuff. Um, and then as applicable, the specs added to this project will work there. So ex express language is kind of the immediate one because that's just like a plus one upgrade to X pages. Um, but your CDI beans will exist there. So if you make a named bean uh, in CDI, you can then access it in X pages just the way you would with a faces config one. You can access the micro profile REST clients. You'd kind of have to kind of like funnel that through a Java class. But like as I showed with the GitHub issues, I was using the micro profile REST client on an X page. Um, other than EL improvements, the act of writing an X page is the same with the same components and capabilities. So, you know, data tables, all that stuff still exists. You know, this project is not about really improving X pages outside of the expression language, um, but it also doesn't damage it and it doesn't cut you off from anything. Uh, you can use X pages alongside JAXRS and the other U UI technologies without issue. Um, in particular, for example, if you're writing REST services, there are the um, there's the XE REST service control and a couple other things. If you're doing custom code for those, you might find JAXRS more pleasant because you do get the nice annotations, you get uh, beam validation, you get translation to and from JSON um, more easily. Uh, and so you don't have to replace those things, but you can, and you can mix and match. So nothing in here is exclusive with anything else. You could have X pages and all the other stuff I'm about to talk about. You don't have to, again, you can. Option two, you could make your app based around REST. So this is uh, a very likely case and you know, increasingly common. You'd write all of your server logic with JAXRS. So you'd say, I'm gonna write a REST application for accessing Domino data. And then for your actual, the thing the user interacts with, you know, for one, it might just be a bot somewhere, but you could use React or Angular, or vanilla, vanilla JavaScript. You could use C and WebAssembly if you want to, who cares? You can just access your REST services that way with whatever. This is something that we're doing with one of my clients as well, where um, we're taking X pages components and translating them and re redoing them for the next version of them as Angular in this case, uh, just accessing services that use code that was extracted from X pages, put into common Java, now is available with, with JAXRS. And so we, we just take piece by piece and are doing that. Um, so we're still using you know, Domino and the, the NSF backend, but now we are just using REST calls. So that's using the newer REST services from here, um, and that will help. And that's a good environment. Um, the app itself could live outside of the NSF, like on the file system or on another server or however you want to do it, or inside the NSF as design elements. And if you want to do that, you could try the NSF ODP tooling project, and that will do some automated build options. So specifically for my clients needs i added the ability to say grab everything from this directory and put it in web content so that's exactly for this case where you have a client javascript app that's built with the front end maven plugin then it builds an nsf that captures all of those index.html and javascript and css and plunks them into the nsf and then you can pair that well with uh, if you had rest services in there um, so you could do that as your um as your setup that lets you like share the ACL and things like that, which is really nice. Um, but again, your client could actually be anything anywhere. They could just say, I'm gonna write a, a UI-less application in the NSF using REST services and just have that be packaged as the NSF and access it externally or whatever you wanna do. And option three is what I'm doing for the um, OpenNTF site. And this is a, a spec called MVC, so just model view controller. It is very boringly named. Um, it's another newer spec. Uh, it's not in Jakarta EE fully, but it is also not in beta. So it is released. It's kind of like a side spec. Hopefully this will also make it into Jakarta EE 11. Um, but this is a spec that builds on top of JAXRS. It's what they deem action oriented as opposed to XPages component based approach. So with XPages, you kind of like the user visits .xsp URL and they kind of like enter into a session dealing with the XPage where you have back and forth and it will do partial refreshes and things like that. Um, MVC is much more about you call a get URL and it gives you back a page. You call a post URL and it gives you back a page. You call put, or well, not from a browser so much, but you know what I mean, where you call these other URLs and it gives you a page or it gives you a part of a page if that's how you're writing your application. Uh, it's closer to the metal. This is not a direct replacement for X pages in all cases. It's good for something like open NCF site, which is primarily a repository of, of not static, but semi-static data. 
the more complicated your business logic is, the more in intricate your interfaces are, the better X pages will do for you. Um, but if you're just doing essentially like a blog or a project repository, a CMS generally, um, something like MVC is going to be really, really nice. Uh, it can work with multiple UI technologies, but JSP is in here and working. Um, and so this is what I've been using. And when I get the OpenNTF website somewhere, you can see more of this in practice. I also use this on my blog currently. It's really, really pleasant for that kind of use. Uh, so in this case, here's a little example. So you'll recognize on the left, this looks like a, well, it is a JAXRS resource where I'm saying the path is the root of the application. Uh, and then here I have the MVC annotation controller. So what this is is saying, this is my controller. And if you've ever used something like Rails or another one of those style of MVC, this is that kind of controller where your code enters into this class and then it says, do some stuff with the back end and then return the view, the page that you're going to look at. So here I'm saying, I want to get 30 recent releases and five blog entries and then render those on the home.jsp page. Uh, it has this models object, which is uh, meant for currying values from your controller to the, the front end. And then if you see on the right, you have the actual home.jsp. This looks a lot like XPages. Um, you know, XPages comes from JSF, which is a componentized, expanded version sort of of JSP. Um, this kind of code will look very familiar. So you've got for each, which is like repeat. You've got C out, which is like XP text and, you know, et cetera. Um, JSP is very, very comfortable if you're if you've been using X pages. Um, again, you could potentially add in different renderers. There are different ways that you can do this, but I've been enjoying JSP when you do it cleanly like this. Um, but you can see here you have the same kind of like T layout as like a custom control, etc. Um, but this is where I'm saying I do all of my logic over here first. Like the the conceptual flow of the user comes first to the home controller class it sets up everything and then says okay now go to home.jsp that might be a different page it might be error.jsp it might be login.jsp however you want to do it um, but that's the conceptual flow the user will come in the controller will handle where they go and it routes them to well, routes uh, it sends them to the home.jsp page um, and this is all rendered. You actually get a nicer URL because it doesn't actually say home.jsp. You have a URL that's like xsp slash app, or it could be xsp slash app slash projects slash the name of the project, et cetera. So other than the xsp part, it's a nicer URL. That part's obligatory on top of that though. And then beyond that, uh, there's some future options that I've been pondering. Uh, it would be nice to get X pages working with this MVC framework. I quite like it. I like setting this stuff up. Uh, I've done a little work on that line, but there are there are intricate parts of the X pages stack that needs more workarounds where like it will stash the request and its information somewhere and it ends up not quite working. That's something I may come back to. Uh, I don't have it working currently, uh, but I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, there's also JSF. So I do have JSF, like the real JSF um, in this project. JSF3 is in here. Um, it's using the My Faces implementation. It's limited though. It, it doesn't have Prime Faces or Apache Debago, which are two of the uh, large, uh, two of the common kind of UI libraries that will give you all the nice stuff. Like kind of like how XPages has the extension library. Um, you'd want, you'd really want something like Prime Faces when you're doing JSF. You don't have to. You can just write a little closer to the metal, but you kind of really want those if you're doing it. It does work as is. It doesn't have a lot of niceties. Um, so you can do it. I've done some tests with it. Um, it needs some work, um, but that is a potential option, which is, you know, say, you know what? I don't want to do X pages anymore, but I still like the conceit. So I'll, I will just do JSF instead. Um, and then another option is other view engines, like for an MVC. So Timeleaf is, I believe, is what Spring uses. There's other ones like um, Handlebars and Mustache and other common kind of like HTML templating languages. Um, MVC has extensions for several of these. I may bring these in. There are other neat things you can do. I may make those either like kind of top level or as extension projects at some point. Um, so I've been kind of pondering what are the what are the other options for for uh, future user interface things. Um, and here I have a couple links to resources if you're curious about these things. So if you want the MVC specification, there's the main link there. Uh, again, Vail Dung has an article talking about how to actually use it. This is it's still fairly current, I think. Um, this will give you a tutorial on how you use it in a normal case. And then there's the specification for JSF. Um, which is now just called Jakarta Faces. Um, so that's, you know, if you're curious about looking into that. 
Uh, and so to wrap this up before questions, just give a little bit about the project information. So uh, here's a link to the GitHub site for the project. Uh, it's also on naturally on OpenNTF, so you can find it there. Uh, a little, a couple months ago, uh, Graham Makers and I did a YouTube series going over this. Um, it's you know some things have changed a bit, but it's still you know 90% or more applicable. Uh, so that's a lengthy video series going over each of these individual components, the ones I've talked about and more, uh, kind of going through all of those. So if you're curious about seeing more of this, seeing more of it in action, and and seeing some more code and and more discussion about it, because Graham did ask some excellent questions, uh, I recommend viewing that. Uh, for requirements and compatibility, it's primarily 901 FB10, um, but I would say uh, 1201 with feature with fixed packs is the way to go. There are some important bugs fixed, especially for Linux with NoSQL. Uh, I, you know, obviously, I would say 1201 with fixed packs anyway, uh, unless you have a specific reason not to. Uh, so, you know, the newer the better, but for the most part, 901 FB10 is the bare minimum. Some things just may not work um, for bug or DQL didn't exist for reasons. This should work with most or all existing libraries. Uh, I use it in production alongside ODA and Poly for X pages in particular. Um, it should work generally, like unless you have a library that also implements these specs, it should work just fine with anything else. This can also be used in OSGI bundles with some knowledge. So this is what I'm doing for that client. I'm also expanding this. I have some ideas for how I would like to expand this um, with web apps in OSGI bundles or OSGI servlets. There's some stuff you can do there. You need, you can do it certainly, um, but it does take knowledge, and I would like to smooth that out a little bit. Um, and then, if you're interested in getting involved, um, first and foremost, just try it out. That's the that's the best way to get, uh, the easiest way to get involved, and one of the best ways. Just try it out, and then let me know. Uh, let me know how well it works for you. If you like it, uh, if you hit problems, if you have questions, uh, can. Tell me on Twitter. You can ideally, even better, put it in Discord so other people can can chat about it. Um, report any bugs on the GitHub page. Uh, request features there as well. Um, but beyond that, if you want to actually um, do some work on this, uh, I could use more documentation. Right now, I have a README that just kind of lists all of the specs and does a cursory overview. But I would love to have guides for specific things, uh, like expanded like wiki pages for any of that. So if you if you are the type that would like to write documentation, I would love that. I I hope to myself uh, eventually, but obviously I am a programmer, and so I'm bad at that, and specifically bad at ever getting around to doing it. Um, I would also love to have more example applications. So I have an open issue where I want to track um, just taking like existing Jakarta and Spring and other uh, example applications out on the web and then doing NSF versions of those so that that way when you go to the repository, you'll have these on disk projects to work with. So that's something I would love to do and that's something that somebody who tries this out and, and enjoys it can also do without having to worry about all the, the innards. Um, but you can also chip in on the code directory. We've had directly. We've had a couple uh, pull requests. Uh, admittedly, things do get very arcane in parts. Um, but you know, sometimes you know, so you may just be familiar with that, and so you may be able to chip in with that. Sometimes a bug may be more explicable. Like if you see a stack trace and track it down and say, "Oh, well, this is just a bug," I would be happy to have that fixed. So that's another way. And so. That'll wrap it up now. Uh, so thank you very much. And we'll go through the, the questions now. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, yes, we got quite a few questions uh, um, ready to go. And so we have a question from some person named Sirdar. Um, when we inject any domino object into a beam, so we still need to define the field transient. No. So um, that will be, so this is, for example, if you want to have a request scope bean or even a, I think it'll work in like session and application scope beans. Um, I wouldn't advise it probably, but it might work. Uh, but especially request scope beans, um, if you inject it in there, CDI will do the job of inserting and removing it for you. So if you say in, inject domino session um, and have that in there, it will not be the same object request by request. So it is not the same as if you said this dot request equals x libutil dot get current session, which do not, I mean, in a request scope, that's fine. But in others, like do not do that. But I think even in any scope bean, it will handle that for you because it handles saying, okay, this is a new request. It knows that the, the domino session is request bound. 
And so it will say, oh, this was a request thing specifically. So if there's a new request, this has to be a new reference to it. Uh, so basically, no, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, great. Um, uh, Bernd would like to know if session assigner is supported. Yes. So in any of these contexts, so this, this is actually one of the neat things from the Jackson REST support originally. Um, session assigner is supported. You can use, uh, if you do add inject at named um, domino session assigner, that will come in. So yes, it is session assigner and session assigner with full access are both supported in, in each of these contexts. You know, so JSP, JSF, JAXRS, well, still X-rated, obviously. Okay, um, great. Uh, is there any performance change, increase or decrease with large data sets using JAXRS versus standard REST to produce so, JSON? I will preface this by saying I have not tested. So I have not done head-to-head -head contests of take a large object from you know like a list of these objects and emit it from JAXRS versus manually do so um, or use the extension library uh, ones. I haven't tested. I have found that doing it this way is very high performance. Um, I have found in practice with client work, um, it helps if you do streaming output, which is a JAXRS um, uh, type, you can emit things that way. You know, once you get to, you know, it also kind of depends on how large of data you're talking about. Like once you get to a certain level, um, you have to really start worrying about it. One thing I will say in the favor of um, the XPages components is that there are those built-in types that will say, give me view source, uh, view data as JSON, that sort of thing. Those do a lot of the legwork that, you know, you kind of have to manage a little more. Uh, you could also do that. Like um, I tweeted about the speed of this earlier where I'm doing pagination in a view with JNoSQL and that is extraordinarily fast. It could be a much larger view than it is and it would still be very fast. So with pagination, you can do that, but you do get some freebies with the extension library stuff. But um, in general, I found that I can get extremely good speed, but I can't say, you know, I, I don't have benchmarks of one versus the other. Okay. Um, let's see. The next uh, third R would like to know um, for CRUD apps with Jakarta NoSQL, um, you don't need to access Domino with views, entries, collections. What would be the best strategy to handle more granular operations? For example, the project name has been changed in the Open NTF site, and all releases need to be updated. Um, I would say. Well, for one, the, the the kind of the idiomatic way to do that right now would be to have a releases repository that gives you, as in the case of OpenNTF, um, releases by project name, and then you would write that to all of them. Um, I would say this would also be a good case with if one of us remembers to put in a feature request issue to add stamp all support, um, which is not currently in there, but that would be the domino performant way to do it. Um, but currently, right now, what you would do is you would say, give me all the releases by project name and then save each one in turn. Um, so you know, obviously, stamp all in a, in a large or medium case would be better for that. Um, but that is, you know, right now, you would just do that kind of object oriented wise. Uh, but then we can extend this to add uh, other efficiencies like, like stamp all. Okay. All right, grab the next one. Uh, you you jumped over the crest the question from uh, Chris. Uh, oh, I did. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. It says we're about to launch a major public-facing website built primarily using XPages as a container for raw HTML with dynamic content generated via AJAX calls to an XPages REST service backed by Java Beans. In terms of performance, would it be worthwhile to replace the REST service with EE and JAXRS? So I would imagine there's probably not going to be, and again, this does go back a little bit to the previous earlier one where I haven't done side-by-side -side tests, except in so far that I have gotten extremely good performance. You know, if you use, uh, if you've written your your services well, like writing using the REST service components or others in X pages, you're going to get very good performance from that as well as from JAXRS. Um, you know, what you would get out of using this toolkit and JAXRS is you would have much less code. So there's less you would have to do, um, less you would have to worry about, and then you would eventually benefit more from improvements. Like if, if DQL or the, this framework improve in you know Domino 13 and DQL is 10 times faster, whatever, it's fast now. Um, but like you would 
the less you write less code and by writing less code you would get more benefits later and it would be easy to manage if your concern though is like which one would be faster right now like is it worth translating this for performance reasons it's not probably um unless unless you happen to be doing it inefficiently but just strictly speaking the two are going to be very comparable performance wise in the good case um it's the ancillary benefits you would get and then it would give you more opportunities to write performant code later so just for performance don't try don't rewrite your code especially if you're about to launch um but in general you know you, you i don't think you would get a performance hit you wouldn't inherently get better performance unless what you're doing happens to be better than what you were doing previously okay thanks um then we have a question from andre who said he at the uh, j knows people website he couldn't find a domino driver is it an ongoing development so that gets into the difficulties of distributing software that uses domino native dependencies um you know, notes.jar is not on Maven Central, and so I can't really distribute anything that requires notes.jar on Maven Central. Um, in theory, since I have committed to the the JNoSQL project, I could um, I could add some PRs to add information about the dominant driver. I probably should now that it's stable. So part of it is that it is it's still ongoing, um, but also part of it is that it's just very difficult to use Domino stuff outside Domino. And so all the other drivers, for example, like the, the Couchbase driver is just a Maven dependency. Um, the, the Mongo driver is just a Maven dependency. This one is, it exists in the OpenNTF Maven server, but it's a piece of an OSGI thing that requires other OSGI stuff and it just gets weird. Part of that is just because Domino is proprietary and not distributed that way. Part of it is OSGI involved. That said, it would be good of me to at least get it listed on the main site, because why not? Uh, the more databases, the better for JNoSQL, and the more exposure, the better for Domino. Okay, okay. down Go to on. our last two questions. I'll take, I'll take this one, and you can have the last one, Howard. Uh, Simon asks, does the Domino NoSQL repository functionality allow you to specify which session object is used to access data? Yes. So I, I kind of, well, actually, let me go back to the slide. I kind of skipped over this, and by kind of, I mean did. Um, back here, I, there's this repository provider, project repository. So what that does is, by default, if you don't have that annotation, a repository will pull from the current NSF as the current user. Um, but you can specify a repository provider, and what that will do is it, it redirects over to a CDI bean that will provide a Domino document entity or something manager. Um, this is stuff that I believe is in the documentation and not in the slides. Um, but what that does is you provide two objects. One is a Lotus Domino database object, and then one is a session object. The session object is used for when it needs session assigner access. This is specifically right now used for um, writing the query results processor views to uh, attempt databases. Um, but the database object can come from however you want to do it. So in this case, I'm using it for to get to the projects repository. So what I'm doing is give me the current session and open this other database that by configure, configured name. But you could there say, use the session as signer and open the same database as signer. So that is how you would go about doing it. And so um, there you could just give it any database anywhere, you know, presumably work over the network or wherever it is. Like you just need to give it a database object. So that be, could be coming from the current database or it could be coming from um, session assigner or, or another session, however you would like to do it. Okay, thanks. And then the final question, we're uh, two minutes from ending. Uh, is ODA an actual requirement to install and run XPages Jakarta E? No. Uh, so this project does not use ODA. Um, if you happen to be using ODA, as as I am in, in some of my projects, and you pass an ODA object into the JDO SQL driver, or you use it manually in your JAXRS services or, or anywhere else, it will work. Um, however, this does not depend on any project outside of itself. I mean, it, it depends on the extension library, but that's built in. Um, it does not require any other um, OpenNTF project or others, well, I mean, uh, other than the stuff that it comes with. So it doesn't use ODA uh, on its own. It will work with it, but it does not inherently use or know about ODA in any way. 
Okay, thanks. And that is the last question, and coincidentally, we're at 12.29. So All thanks, right. Jesse. I know you put a lot of work into this and been, you know, working on this project for quite a while, um, and appreciate your sharing your, uh, your expertise. Thank you. And thanks also, Graham, for helping out today. Uh, so our next webinar will be in September, uh, and it will cover Docker, and we'll get some details out on that in the next few days. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending and and um, hope your rest of your day is, is goes great. We'll speak to everyone in September. Take care.